Well, I invite you to turn as a cross-reference to Matthew chapter 6, and then we'll turn back to the passage in 1 Peter 5, which is the focus of these mornings. And we'll read uh, Jesus' words after he has uh, encouraged his listeners not to lay up for themselves treasures on earth, but rather in heaven, has pointed out that no one can serve two masters, Uh, You'll either be devoted to one and despise the other. You definitely can't serve God and money, he says. And then comes the therefore, verse 25 of Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thanks be to God for his word. A brief prayer. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, back to 1 Peter chapter 5, and our focus this morning is just on one verse. That's the seventh verse, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Uh, Yesterday morning, we were tackled by this whole question of humility, which of us did not uh, leave our study uh, without sensing the need for this lovely, Christ-like characteristic to be increasingly evident in our lives. If we did, that if we did not leave in that manner, then we need it more than we actually realize. This morning, uh, we come to an issue that instead of cultivating it, uh, quite honestly, we would like to experience less of it. And there are, uh, I think, some 365 times in the Bible where the uh, word is given, do not fear or fear not. So the Bible takes into account uh, the natural propensity on the heart of men and women uh, to be anxious and to be fearful. And certainly Peter, as he writes now to the scattered believers of his day, is able to identify with that on a personal basis. After all, we must assume that he paid attention as Jesus gave the instruction that we have just read from Matthew chapter 6. And I try to point out by emphasis in the way in which I read it, the numerous occasions in which the word anxious, which is translated in the ESV from which I'm reading as anxious or worry, uh, comes again and again. The framework for our study will simply be this. Let's think for a moment or two about anxiety itself and then uh, consider uh, what what does the Bible say we're supposed to do about anxiety and uh, what assurance do we have that we can proceed in the light of this. Uh, First of all, we must remember when we're studying the Bible, although I'm not here to tell you how to study the Bible, but just to remind you of the things that you already know, Uh, but you don't want us, we don't want to start applying this to ourselves until we have reminded ourselves that this was not written to us. It wasn't written to the morning chapel at DTS. It was written to those who identified at the beginning of the letter. And uh, therefore, these are individuals 
uh, for whom this particular exhortation would have been profoundly meaningful. It certainly would not have been regarded by them as theoretical in any way. Uh, they were in a minority status in the culture in which they lived. They were regarded as antisocial. They were a downright nuisance, and nobody really wanted to be bothered with them at all. They lived with the reality of suffering and with the prospect of suffering. They lived with the thought that violence may break out upon them at any time like the eruption of a volcano. And therefore, they had within simply the context in which their everyday lives uh, took place plenty of reasons to succumb to worry, to fearfulness, and to anxiety. We want to remind ourselves, too, that they were uh, normal people. Uh, there were normal people back then. Uh, we tend to think that uh, in a very uh, prideful way that, you know, further, further along the line, you know, we're the normal ones and back there there were other people. But no, they, they would have uh, worried about their lives, how long or short they would be, their families, their future, their employment or their lack of employment. Engaged couples would have wondered if they would live long enough in order to be married and so on. Businessmen would be trying to uh, make sure that they maximize their profits. In other words, uh, they live their lives in that way. And the exhortation is given to them there and then. It is clearly, of course, uh, not difficult for us to then say, well, not a lot has changed in 2,000 years because if we were to take a poll right now behind all the faces that I see in front of me, we would, not to we would not have to dig very deeply into one another's lives to acknowledge that whatever the area, each of us would be able to say, well, there are certain things, if I'm honest, that I am worrying about right now. Some of them may be immediate. Some of them may be peculiar fears that we have for our own health because of the discoveries of genetics. There are all kinds of things that seek to undo us and to destabilize us. And so uh, the word has a kind of contemporary ring to it. Anxiety is part of the fabric of contemporary life. Uh, fear tends to focus on specifics. Anxiety is just a kind of general thing. It's sort of like, well, I'm, I, or, or it's like dread. Uh, Kierkegaard referred to it as dread, just a sense of dread. What are you dreading? Well, I don't really know, but it, it, it does feel dreadful. Um, it's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's a, it, it makes it difficult for us just to cope uh, with, with life itself. It can be like a, a malaise that begins to settle over us. It can come from nowhere at all. Some of us worry about being in crowds. Others about being lonely. Some of us are worrying about failing. Others of us are worrying about the sense of success. Some of us are worrying about there's so much change. Others of us are worrying about why is everything so routine? <laughs> Some of us are worrying about heights. Some of us have never been in the heights. And underlying it all, the great anxiety, underlying all anxiety, is the fear of death. The fear of death. Woody Allen is the, the poster boy for nihilism. <laughs> he is scared to death of death. He talks about it all the time. He, he tries to joke about it as if he can chase it away with humor. This is, this is Woody Allen. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. <laughs> I don't want to live on... The I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> okay, that's straightforward, isn't it? And sometimes anxiety can reach absolutely epidemic heights. Years ago now, in a one-woman play uh, on Broadway, the, 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 it was written by a lady called Anne, I can't remember her last name, but Lily Tomlin played the multiple characters in the play. I never saw it, but I read the, I read the play. And uh, she comes on in various characters, and at one point she does this whole uh, uh, worry piece. And, you know, she says crazy things. I worry that if olive oil comes from olives and peanut oil comes from peanuts, where does baby oil come from? And things like that. Uh, and, and, and she runs through a whole litany of these things. And then at one point she, she says, uh, I worry 
about my place in the cosmic scheme of things. And then she says, I worry that there is no cosmic scheme of things. The great underlying worry. Sartre saw it in terms of man's concern about his past and his parents. Marx, man's relationship to his future and to his neighbors. Kierkegaard saw it in terms of his relationship to eternity and to God. Both history, philosophy, theology chronicle the fact of what human experience affirms, namely that fear or anxiety is not an unknown emotion. And some of us, uh, not paying careful attention to Jesus' exhortation to take it a day at a time, find ourselves with great difficulty in living in the present because of the implications of our past or because of our apprehensions about the future. I don't need to say anything further than that. I think it, it makes the point. The Bible addresses it. We experience it. There we have it. But what are we dealing with when we address this. The word here for anxiety it has as an essential meaning uh, simply to divide, to divide. That sense of being distracted and being divided, uh, that sense that creates instability, if you like, or uncertainty, which further fuels our fears. And the real question is, what are we supposed to do about it? Uh, how are we supposed to find a cure for it. Uh, one of the things I find most helpful in this regard, as someone who knows what it is to worry or to be anxious, is that the Bible does not say to us, and Jesus didn't say in Matthew 6, you know, in terms of this anxiety thing, fellas, forget about it. You know, just don't worry about it. Uh, it'll, all, it'll all go away by itself. No, he, he doesn't say that at all. Uh, the Bible doesn't encourage us uh, to deny its presence nor to try and ignore it, nor to run from it. But rather, the exhortation, the imperative is clear, although you will notice that it is not actually an imperative. Uh, the verb there is casting. I think in the, certainly in the NIV, they had it as cast. They had it as an imperative. You may have the NIV with you. I say it from memory, so I may be wrong. Don't hold me to it. But it's very important that it is casting because the imperative is in verse 6. Humble yourselves, forget the middle part, and then go to the beginning of verse 7. Humble yourselves casting. Humble yourselves casting. Because you see, the key to the casting of anxiety is humility. So that's why the exhortation is to bow down under the loving sovereignty of God in order that we might then turn to God with the things that seek to undo us. Now, the, the word that is used is, is, a, is an intensive verb, to cast. It, it doesn't, it's, not like, it's not a verb that would be used for somebody who had uh, visited in your home and had taken one of your uh, mother's uh, fine pieces of porcelain and was going to uh, just move it. May I just move this so that I can have my coffee here? That, that's not the word. The word is of, of a schoolboy coming home on a Friday afternoon, taking his uh, school bag and <laughs> depositing it, okay? It's like, whoa, ho, Friday, fantastic. Don't you want to look at that, says his mother? No, I absolutely do not. I am, I am casting it aside for the time being. That is the kind of verb that is used here. And it is important that we recognize that. It's decisive. It's energetic, and it is action-packed. Instead of going through our days pressed down by the burden of anxiety, we are, quite simply, to cast all our anxieties on him. Cast them all on him. Now, again, I want to make it uh, clear to us that this really, the, 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 at the heart of it all, anxiety is rooted in trying to care by myself for that which only God can do, right? And worry reigns in, in, in our lives when we think or act as if something is ultimately up to me rather than up to God. 
It actually has to do with the desire to control things, to control things physically or materially. You already someone's prayed this morning about helping people with their money. And uh, I get that. And it can become a paralyzing affair. And so the exhortation is equally clear. So our willingness not to take matters into our own hands, our willingness to refuse to struggle with a kind of self-pitying anxiety is in itself an expression of humility. And when I'm overwhelmed by these things, it's usually because I have decided that uh, uh, somehow or another I'm on my own with this one, that, uh, or that I can actually handle this by myself, or that if I just uh, get a little bit more like Martha, I'll be able to get this thing under control. And it really ticks me off when I run into a bunch of Marys who have apparently chosen the good part and it will not be taken away from them. <laughs> Martha, Martha, do you really think this is what you have to do? You're distracted. You're divided. I've got to do it. 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 What about Mary over here? She isn't doing anything worthwhile. No, you worry about Mary. Mary's doing fine. She's actually chosen the better part in this situation. So for those of us who are by nature activists, this is really hard. And if our temptation is to say, we'll get out of this, I can fix this, I've fixed stuff like this before, then we actually embed ourselves in the problem. Um, you know, I don't know if you like to fly, I like to fly. But every so often in, in, in mid-flight somewhere, usually in the darkness of a night over an ocean, I have these paralyzing, bizarre thoughts. It goes like this. I haven't heard from the pilots in a long time. <laughs> and then I say, well, you shouldn't really. I mean, then I say, yeah, but I, I, hope, they're, I hope they're still awake. <laughs> Then it gets worse, it gets epidemic. Then I go, I hope they're still alive. <laughs> and then I say, but these planes can fly forever. And then I say, but I don't want to fly forever. <laughs> I want to land. And sometimes it has got so bizarre that I actually come up with a, with a, with a thing and I say to one of the, uh, the, the flight attendants, I say, um, where are we right now? They usually say, I don't know. And I say, could you check with the pilot? <laughs> That way, at least I know that they've had a conversation. And they come back, they come back and tell me, you know, you're, you're over the ocean. They say, oh, oh, that's good. I was worried that we might not be. A, yeah. But who do I think I am? I'm in row 27B. I got nothing to do with flying the plane. I can't fly the plane from row 27. I couldn't even fly it from the cockpit as far as, as, far as that's concerned. Right? It's, it's irrational, but it's real. Growing up in Scotland on the, on the River Clyde in Glasgow, uh, there was a big ferry that went across taking cars, and there was a wee ferry that went across taking passengers. And a good day out for me and my grandfather would be when we went across on the big ferry and came back on the wee ferry. Um, no Nintendo for me or... None of, none of this then. And, uh, and sometimes uh, on the River Clyde, with the arrival of an ocean-going liner, uh, you would be able to stand and witness something that I had to have explained to me as a boy. And that was that a small tender came out from uh, the, uh, the, the head of the bank and, and approached this giant liner, which is obviously slowed down. And then somebody went up the stairwell and onto the liner. And then my grandfather explained, that's the pilot. The, 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 the pilot knows the River Clyde, knows how to navigate it safely into the harbor. And the man who's been able to get it all across the ocean is actually incapable of getting it in there because he doesn't know the geography of it. And that gave rise to the Everything in Scotland at that time gave rise to a children's song. Now it goes like this. Uh, do you want a pilot? Signal then to Jesus. Do you want a pilot? Bid him come on board. 
and he will safely guide across life's ocean wide until at last we reach the heavenly harbor. How are we going to continue in the Christian faith? How am I going to make sure that when I take seriously the exhortations of Hebrews, see to it that you do not have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God? Oh, what is my confidence? In my pilot. He who has begun a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. But now we're jumping forward to our final study on Friday. If I did it now, of course, we could skip Friday. That's a thought. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that would be part of the deal. Uh, the, the other little children's song that I might as well throw in now as I think about it is, um, you know, said, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Oh, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus says, Have you thought about the birds of the air? Have you thought about these things? Now, that actually is so vitally important, isn't it? Because this is not an exhortation to false cries of bravado. This is actually a willingness to acknowledge the fact. In fact, Peter doesn't say, if any of you in the off chance ever find yourself dealing with worry, um, then I've put a little PS at the end of my letter for you. No, 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 no. No, he says, casting all your anxieties. So you have anxieties. All of them. All of them. The whole shooting match. You see, we may not be able to deal with the nature or the cause of our anxiety, whatever it might be, unemployment, singleness, recurring illness. But we can refuse, by the help of God's Spirit, to be burdened by these things, by the care that weighs us down, <laughs> that disturbs our peace, that distracts our minds. And why? Because of the promise that is embedded in our text. Casting all your anxieties on him because. Because. So, so it, I find it wonderful, wonderfully helpful because that makes sense. If Phillips paraphrases it, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him for you are his personal concern. Auto melai peri humon. You are his personal concern. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I've often said to young people, why don't you write this in your resume? Just see the reaction that you get. You know, studied here, did that there, worked for them, did that the next thing. And then down at the bottom, just say, um, where it says, you know, anything notable about you? Say, no, nothing really notable, but I am worth more than many sparrows. Nobody's taking me up on it, but I, wa I can't imagine. A guy's go for a job, you know, with Google, and at the bottom it says, I'm worth more than many sparrows. Tell me about that. Well, I will tell you about that. That's what Jesus said. He said, if my heavenly Father looks after sparrows and you're worth more than many sparrows, think it out. You see, the, the antidote, the answer, is theological because of the godness of God because of who God is. And, what, and what, what we're being asked to do in the Bible, and particularly here, Jesus, he's asking his disciples to think, think. There's a novel idea, huh? How, why don't you try thinking instead of feeling your way into the situation? Let's sing the song 20 times, see if we feel any better after that, you know? No, think, think properly. Consider, says Jesus, set your mind on, think about this, examine that, and then extrapolate from the lesser to the greater. If you being evil or earthly know how to give good gifts to your children, which you do, then how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, give good things to them that ask him? You see, there's an inherent theological logic in it. And it involves actually getting our priorities in line. 
Uh, the chief end of man, as the shorter catechism actually says, it reminds us that the chief end of man is to glorify God and actually to enjoy him forever. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be put in place. Now, this is a lesson that has to be learned and relearned all the time. Sick, the future comes in at the rate of 60 seconds a minute. <laughs> and these principles are applied at the rate of 60 seconds a minute. Again, I say to you that if you think these matters, I, I talk to young people all the time now. Are young people, I was once young. Young people are impatient. They overestimate what they can accomplish in a year. They underestimate what can be achieved in five years. They want everything fixed immediately. Listen, it doesn't get fixed immediately. Otherwise, those of us who have made it into our sixth or our seventh decade would just be paragons of uh, amazing uh, virtue and tranquility and uh, people would want just to walk with us just to catch the aura, just, <laughs> just to get it. But they've been with us and they don't want the aura. Remember, I mean, the disciples were in the presence of, of Almighty God. And they had the audacity. <laughs> it's fantastic. Can you imagine Jesus picks his team? What a team. <laughs> what a group, you know. Philip, how many dumb questions are you planning on asking? <laughs> Thomas, just get to the back of the bus, you know. <laughs> They, 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 they absolutely didn't get it, did they? Get rid of these children. Jesus is doing evangelistic ministry. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. Come, bring the children to Jesus. Yes, yes, Jesus would love to talk to them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lord, we came back from the campaign. Nothing much happened. There was a big resistance to us. Do you think we should call down fire from heaven and torch the place? <laughs> Jesus said, no, I don't think we ought to do that. Not, not this morning. No, no. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, just so you know, we are drowning right now. We thought you'd want to know. <laughs> so you're worried that you got worried about something? Jesus knows all about our troubles. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. There isn't. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He wept to the grave of his friend. He was overwhelmed with the prospect of suffering. He was burdened by the heat of the day. The danger of a less than human Christ is equal to the danger of a less than divine Christ, as the history of theology has proved. You see, the first readers of this letter were surrounded by people whose religious activity was devoted to try and make the deity care. So by prayers of sacrifice and so on, a lot like the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament, they wanted somehow or another to engage with divinity in the hope that divinity would both hear them and be able to do something for them. And this little phrase here is a Christian distinctive. Four words. He cares for you. He cares for you. In, in a culture, the culture in which we live, which is riddled with pantheism, I mean, the, in, the impact of, of Hinduism in America is actually beyond comprehension. You don't need just to go to the ladies' yoga class to get it. You just walk up the high street. And, it, and, and the, the extent to which it is embedded in people's minds, just listen to them talk. So their notion is that somehow or another, divinity is contained within his creation, within creation, and that the answer to our problems, which are all external to us, will be found by looking into ourselves. The gospel says no. Our essential problems are within ourselves, and the answer is found in looking outside of ourselves into the God who has not only created everything by the word of his power, but sustains it. On a, on a daily basis. So it's a good reminder to us, isn't it, that uh, God's care uh, extends even to the wee details of our lives. 
And if ever we were to doubt uh, the care of God, then we just go to uh, the cross. Because the ultimate expression of God's care is seen there, is heard there in his cry. And it was discovered there in a moment when the one thief said, you know, we are up here getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Some of us are fighting a battle in this realm, in secret probably. We're saying to ourselves, I don't know if I'll ever get over this. Will it always be this way? What will happen if? Why can't things be different, even though our friends don't seem to understand? And a good hymn book will help you. And standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. And he's the only one who cares and understands. And standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. And you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. And he's the one who said, hey guys, quit worrying about this stuff. Don't you realize you have a heavenly father? It's almost like a children's talk, isn't it? It is a children's talk. We're the children. Father, thank you that the Bible rewards our study. Thank you that we can go back now and think these things out as we necessarily must do. We pray that in the hours of this day, as we um, find within ourselves the, the temptation to blow our trumpet, that you will... Uh, remind us of the beauty of Jesus. And when that telephone call comes, or when the blood test comes back, or when the news of our loved one reaches us, we pray that you will enable us, humbling ourselves before you, the Almighty God, to cast all of our cares upon you in the awareness that you care for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>